Next, we have a round table case discussion of a case born at 27 weeks. The moderator for the session is Dr. Prakash Manikoth. Dr. Prakash Manikoth, consultant neonatologist, Armed Force Hospital, Musket, Oman. He is also a clinical lecturer in pediatrics and trainer in pediatrics and neonatology. He has published widely in the peer-reviewed journals and is a reviewer for international journals and McMaster online rating of evidence. His areas of academic interest include golden hour management, non-invasive ventilation, neonatal care in low resource settings, and quality improvement initiatives. We kindly welcome you, sir, to the dais. We humbly invite the delegates participating in the roundtable case discussion to occupy the dais. We welcome Dr. Manoj Malviya, Dr. Arun Nair, Professor Elon Shani, Professor Shivani Shankar, Professor Leslie Lewis. You will call him? While they start the idea of having case discussions in our uh, uh, conference was suggested and when it was suggested, it was suggested in a different way, a live case to be presented by the per person who actually experienced and then to be discussed. But then with the time, the pattern evolved. That is how we planned uh, uh, in 2019 when we designed the 2020 IAP Neocon. But within the, within the next two years, it evolved. And then when we had more uh, sessions being added, it had to be made to it. This is a case that has actually happened, but uh, it is not being presented by the people who have uh, actually had this baby. Over to you. Yeah. Uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, greetings from Oman, where I worked for the last uh, 30 years. Uh, I compliment the organizers and the team Manoj for organizing such an amazing academic activity. And uh, I thank him for giving me the privilege to moderate this session. Uh, we have, I'm also privileged to moderate this session by a panel of experts from around the globe. Starting with uh, Professor Leslie Lewis, who is the head of department at KMC Manipal, Dr. Elon Shani from Israel, Manoj Maravia from Oman, Dr. Arun Nair from New Zealand, and Dr. Shivani Shankar from Paris. We expect Arun Nair to join shortly. Yeah, he's in front of me. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have no conflict of interest and nothing to disclose. Uh, my panelists have agreed for a very micro introduction. I'll take only 10 seconds. Uh, Dr. Arun Nair uh, is uh, currently working at the, uh, as a neonatal pediatrician and consultant neurologist at the Waikato Hospital, Hamilton, New Zealand. He's a, cl a senior clinical lecturer in pediatrics, College of Medicine, Auckland, and he has been a PA for many studies. Uh, with that, I'll go to the next person. Uh, professor Elon Shani is from Israel. He is a professor in pediatrics at the Ben Gurion University of uh, Niger, and head of the neural department in uh, Soroka Medical Center, Israel. I like his uh, comment, leave study and graduate in Israel. A so simple man, and his areas of interest, traveling and meeting people. Uh, professor Leslie Lewis is the head of department at Kasuba Medical College, Manipal. I'm sure most of you are familiar with him. Uh, he has published extensively. He is a PA for many projects. And uh, he has ever been a recipient of many awards also. And Dr. Manoj Malavia is currently a senior consultant in neonatology at the Kaula Hospital. 
He was my colleague at Royal Hospital for over 10 years before he went to Canada and Australia. And he has again come back a second time. Uh, I think I'll skip mine. Uh, Dr. Shivani Shankar Aguilera, he is working as a senior consultant and ICO at Antonio uh, Beckler Hospital, South Paris University, Clermont. Uh, she is a member of uh, European Society of Pediatric and Neonatal Intensive Care. And she is an expert on lung ultrasound. I was fortunate to attend her lung ultrasound workshop to, today morning. Uh, over the past five decades, neonatology is in a state of flux and uh, uh, ranging from experience based to evidence based to finally Christian medicine. But I still believe it's an art based on science, and that's why we have the expert panelists sitting here. Uh, Professor Leslie Lewis will start with managing the golden hour and followed by Dr. Shivani, who will support the lung. Manoj will support the heart. Elon will support the brain. And finally, Arun Nair will talk about feeding. Uh, coming to the first one, uh, I'll start with a case study. Uh, th a 30-year-old woman at 26, uh, 27 weeks gestation is uh, with a growth-restricted fetus of 24 weeks is admitted in labor, received a dose of Dexa and Maxilf. On admission to the labor room, she is febrile. Her cervix is three centimeter dilated. Maxilf continued and second dose of Dexa given. Uterine contractions continued with the progressive cervical dilatation. NIUC team is informed to prepare for imminent delivery. So Professor Leslie, what antenatal counsel will you give to the patients and how will you do a team briefing? Yeah. Uh... Here, uh, as uh, Professor Swanarika, but Madam has pointed out, the parents are important. And any antenatal counseling, parents is the key. Only thing is, some of us are, forgets the obstetrics colleagues. So we want to have obstetrics colleagues with, with us, along with the parents. And uh, our concentration in India is to improve the outcome of 26 to 28 weeks gestation. So I will tell this is what is the outcome of the babies. These are the immediate outcomes. These are the problems are anticipated. ABC is uh, the baby requiring a resuscitation, ventilation, surfactant, maybe. And uh, second thing is the complications, which a baby could have. Could be a necrotizing enterocolitis, a poor feeding, or uh, chances of uh, the intraventricular hemorrhage. And then the important fact is uh, most of our parents are not able to afford the cost the for this baby, which might take at least uh, three months of a hospital stay. Our uh, discharge criteria is 1,700 grams, 35, 36 weeks completed. So our set set up maybe about cost about three lakhs rupees, plus minus government insurance, private insurance and a shot about the a long term outcome and the obstetrics colleagues is to be there while i do the counseling most of the times we forget them this is what i had to do team briefing i will take the best team who could able to best persons who's expert in intubation it's not the senior most but he who has done a number of high risk deliveries and intubation a second person could be to take care of a the cardiovascular support, third person for medication and documentation, four people, one senior or resident, one respiratory therapy facilities we have, and staff nurse. And I assign the role to them, and plus team briefing with the obstetrics team also, what to be done, and and I am I will be taking the lead here. Yeah, that's well said, Professor Leslie. Uh, shall I just throw some questions to the audience? In this particular infant, 27 weeks with 24 weeks gestation, delayed cord clamping is indicated. Uh, I will ask the audience to raise their hands if it is true. Okay. Uh, umbilical cord milking is indicated in the absence of delayed cord clamping. Please raise your hands if it is true. Nobody. Okay, great. Uh, Eutrotonic is given soon after delivery before uh, delayed cord clamping. Raise your hands if it is true. Nobody. Great. 
So, Professor Leslie, what is the current recommendation for delayed cord clamping in extreme preterm infants? Do you advise umbilical cord milking in extreme preterm? And what is the ideal time to administer a uterotonic, which is commonly pitocin? Okay. Uh, the what we have is presently twenty-eight weeks and above, at least thirty seconds to uh, two minutes of a delayed cord clamping. If the baby is having good respiratory efforts, if there is no good respiratory efforts, and we can take a call there, resuscitating the baby with the intact cord and continuing. Delayed uh, umbilical cord milking we don't do routinely, and uh, I'm sure there is a. Uh, no uh, uh, information or uh, no evidence is available below 28 weeks of gestation to do the umbilical cord milking. So I won't consider umbilical cord milking. When I talk, okay, can you just uh, cancel that echo from the panelist? So the last uh, statement, the oxytocin. Oxytocin, yes. Maybe the after the umbilical cord, uh, I mean, I think we should do is umbilical cord as cut, we should give the oxytocin and not before that. Okay. So you, you can continue. Your, uh... Okay. Uh, see, this is the, I think this is the uh, published data which is there. The uh, why delayed cord clamping everyone now know about it and i think it is a five minutes uh, the uh, uh, saturation is better when we have a, a delayed cord clamping of more than 30 seconds may be extended for a certain period of time whereas uh, early cord clamping the set targets of a saturation may not have reached so that's the reason the best to have a delayed cord clamping and it is practice uh, Professor Leslie, is it feasible and appropriate to resuscitate with an intact cord? Yes, we should do it and we are doing it. Uh, I will be happy doing it for a 28 week or onwards. We don't have much of exposure below 26 weeks onwards. And these are the two tables, the Mayo table, which is there on the left side, which is uh, very cost effective, which is, can be just slide into the, the operating room where the operating operation is going on. And the baby can be taken over there and resuscitated on that table with the intact, intact cord. The other one is expensive and we don't have it. Uh, can you discuss the concept and key elements of the golden hour? And what preparations will you be required for delivery? And describe a sample. Yes. Golden hour protocol. Yeah. Briefly. Three things I will be concentrating. Uh, first is our temperature, and uh, I put up here 26 to 28, mm -hmm. even though it, where it is 24 to 26 minute uh, a second uh, degrees mentioned, because that is what is required. A pre-warm linen, rewarming surfaces, eliminating the drafts are ex re required, and we use the uh, the warmer to resuscitate. We don't have a facility everywhere, the incubator to resuscitate. So that is what we are following. Directly put the baby into the polythene bag. And then the person, the baby is uh, vigorous, just put the TP's resuscitator with a PIP of around 15 to 16 and a PIP of around 6 and be a 5 of 21 to 30 percent. If the baby is uh, non vigorous, then maybe continue for about five to 10, uh, 10 to 15 seconds of uh, TP's resuscitation and then consider to uh, the uh, intubate. If the baby is already having a good respiratory support, continue on a CPAP, delivery room CPAP, around five to six centimeter of uh, the support, pressure support with a heated humidifier. I mean, the warm, uh, the humidification and blender is required. And then we won't consider giving a surfactant in the delivery room. Possibly, I will ship the baby to the the resus the NICU and consider based on the baby's condition to give a surfactant. So this is immediately next is shifting the baby to NICU. So and keeping the baby on a peripheral IV axis or maybe umbilical IV axis. So preferred fluid is around 10% dextrose, 80 to 100 ml per kilo for less than 1000 grams. And this is babies under the warmer, around four to six milligrams per kilo per minute of a glucose. And that is uh, the targets what I'm using. And my first glucose level in the baby should be around uh, 50 and up. 
and then amino acid uh, continuations we will do it so further continuing uh, the we uh, we will con uh, avoid the hyperglycemia in this baby and uh, we continue the respiratory support as i mentioned since the baby is breathing well possibly we will continue the non invasive support with a cpap alone surfactant it depends on the baby's condition if the baby is not breathing and required to intubate required more than 30% of oxygen possibly i will consider surfactant okay uh, what about sepsis how do you proceed yes a uh, very important thing i think uh, mandatory to have a, a precautions a strict asepsis uh, no routine use of antibiotics unless there is a strong indications are there a maternal infection is there maybe i will consider first dose of uh, ampicillin in our setup we consider ampicillin and amonoglycoside as a first level antibiotic otherwise i won't do it and basic uh, labs in that first hour i will do is glucose wbc counts culture and uh, maybe a capillary gas or a venous gas to sum up till the slides come up uh the first one hour so pardon bro pardon professor kaldival sorry to interrupt professor kaldival are you there yes i'm here uh aha uh -huh, hi Uh, i'm so sorry since uh, we we waited for you and then we started the next session so after this is over shall we start immediately after this will it be too late for you no no it's okay i thought this was my time all right all right so uh, maybe after half an hour we can have your session and it's it uh, uh, that's okay with you yeah so did i did i read the time wrong No, yeah, because we waited for you for ten minutes. Then we started the uh, next session. Four forty-five p.m. EST to me was twenty-one uh, forty-five, so it was an hour late. So I apologize for that. I must have read the time wrong. No, 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 not an issue. I will have to stop this because people are watching. They will not be able to view view the other one online. Uh, I I do not have a separate link, so I'm interrupting them with a uh, sincere apologies to all those who are watching. Uh, so okay. Uh, is it okay after this session is over? Immediately we'll call you if it is yeah, okay. Yeah, sure, no problem. Yeah. And then we I'll will have to wind up the session at six uh, twenty Indian time because we have another online speaker, Professor Martin Kessler. Uh, immediately after that, so okay. that will be another session. We lost ten sure. minutes, so we have we will have to catch up with that. Right? Anyway, okay. Thank you. So I'll okay. I'll uh, ca catch you in another uh, in, uh, maybe half an hour. Half an hour. Okay. Thank okay. you. I'll stay Not on. Half, just tell you. Yeah, half an hour. Yeah. Okay. I'll stay. Deepis, raise your hands if you say it is okay, or is it provide CPAP or is it intubate and administer? How will you? Who will prefer uh, option A? Please raise your hands. Who will prefer option B? Okay, that's the right answer. Uh, Doctor Shivani, can you tell us what is the ideal mode of respiratory support after birth, and what uh, are the actual indications for intubation and surfactant administration? Okay, so I had a couple of slides, but I think Dr. Leslie has covered it already. Just after birth, of course, CPAP is the preferred mode of um, of respiration, uh, prophylactic CPAP. We take a few cu couple of seconds every thirty seconds to to uh, evaluate and assess whether the baby is transitioning satisfactorily from the intrauterine to extrauterine life. Okay, so you. Take some time to see whether the transition is incomplete. Does the baby need some more time, or is it completely failed or poor transition by assessing heart rate, work of breathing, and the tone of the baby? Okay, so um, if the transition is incomplete or failed, you can, along with your uh, positive pressure ventilation, give five inflation breaths, two to three seconds. and if the baby is still not breathing you can uh, ventilate the baby at 30 per minute okay so this is all to establish 
a satisfactory transition in a baby who has spontaneous breathing efforts. Um, I'm so showing these slides, these uh, graphics from the European Resusc Resuscitation uh, Recommendations, which came out in 2021 based on the ILCOR consensus of which Professor Davis was a part uh, in 2020. So uh, the idea is to reach 85% or more than 80% SpO2 by five minutes of life. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you... now we have our baby on CPAP whose uh, transition satisfactorily is vigorous, spontaneously breathing. We are in a catch-22 situation now or, you know, um, in a bit of a dilemma. We know that surfactant is more efficient when administered within the first three hours of life. However, most of our babies, when they are stable on CPAP and there's no sepsis or any other uh, problem, they go on to increase their oxygen requirements after three hours of life. And for the moment, for lack of any other um, evaluating factor, for the moment, FiO2 requirement is the by default uh, measurement which we take as CPAP failure. There are other things, but in the first few hours of life, that is the most commonly, uh, even though it's very arbitrary and the level of evidence is very low, but uh, more than 30% FiO2 is the, is the currently uh, agreed upon consensus to administer surfactant. So the, uh, the, the dilemma we were facing was how to know which baby will um, need surfactant and probably give it in the three hour period if possible. So uh, this is where uh, the lung ultrasound uh, comes in. We've been doing it for the last eight years. We've talked a lot about limited and low resource settings. So this is a way to take what we have already even a step further. So uh, this is a resource which is in every uh, neonatal unit, an ultrasound machine where it's in addition to looking at other organs, you look at the lungs, and we've just defined a semi-quantitative lung ultrasound score, whereby you score six uh, areas of the um, of the lung. You give them a score from zero to three, so the maximum score a baby can have is 18, and the lowest score a baby can have is zero. Zero is like perfectly normal lungs, and with a cutoff score of eight for babies less than 28 weeks, um, it has a 90% specificity and sensitivity to predict which babies will go on to receive, uh, to increase their FIO2 requirements. So can you describe the preferred ventilation strategies in the RDS? Yeah, so um, it's a vast subject, difficult to say in just one slide. But there is one thing I would like to insist on, which is the period when you administer surfactant is when you administer, administer surfactant and you uh, if you do it by insure or if you keep the baby intubated, that is the time when due to the surfactant, the compliance will increase dramatically. And so if you're on a purely pressure support ventilation, you risk... Um, causing a lot of volume trauma for the same amount of pressure. So this is the period where um, a volume controlled or volume guarantee is very important so that the baby auto weans itself on, on the pressure. So a pressure support with volume guarantee, uh, you can use an SIPPV with, uh, with VG, which is a very uh, protective protective mode. There are other, you know, uh, modes. I personally like high frequency in case babies need uh, ventilation for a longer time. But there is one thing we have to know. We've talked about non-invasive ventilation at every point of time. When you see the baby, you need to ask, why is the baby still ventilated mechanically? And at any point of time, non-invasive ventilation is better than mechanical ventilation. Yeah. In a few seconds, uh, what about oxygenation targets for preterm infants? Yeah. So, um, in the Cochrane reviews and uh, the Neoprom study, uh, between the lower and higher oxygenation targets, there was no real significant uh, impact on the composite death and major disability uh, at one and a half or two years of age. Okay, The only um, difference was in the lower SpO2 range, the rate of death and necrotizing enterocolitis was higher and the rate of uh, retinopathy was less. So the current practice or the current guidelines are to have... Uh, 
uh, a range, a, a wide enough range so the baby actually spends time in it and not keep decreasing and increasing oxygen, uh, the, the uh, oxygen delivered. So 90 to 95 percent with an alarm setting of 89 to 96 percent. And uh, there is an argument if you are in a center which has more ROP, you can probably adjust your uh, your FiO2, your SpO2 ranges uh, within a couple of um, with a couple of uh, shortening or incre increment of the range. Yeah, continuing on the case study, the caffeine is loaded at one hour while on CPAP gets intubated. Uh, caffeine loaded at one hour while on CPAP gets intubated because of increasing oxygen requirement. Uh, receives surfactant, SIPP mode of ventilation, providing uh, six ml per kg of tidal volume. Uh, and two hours after surfactant, the uh, oxygen requirement comes down to 30%. But the ventilator settings remain the same with an expirated idle volume now reading 8 ml per kg. And four hours after surfactant therapy, she requests still higher 70% FiO2 to maintain SpO2 of 94. She's tachypneic with severe subcostal recessions, decreased air entry of the left hemithorax. To the audience, which of the following is mostly di uh, likely diagnosis? Uh, who will be saying option A, E? Anybody for option E? Okay, option A. Okay, that's a great majority. Okay, fine. Uh, so, Dr. Shivani, can you uh, explain the role of lung ultrasound in the assessment of complications? Yeah, sure. Lung ultrasound is uh, a very non invasive, uh, zero cost uh, assessment mm. that you can do. On, and get an immediate answer. Um, one of the studies our Italian counterparts did was to see how long it takes to diagnose a pneumothorax on chest X-rays or um, lung ultrasound. And the lung ultrasound delay was four to five minutes, whereas the chest X-ray, the best they could get was 20 minutes. So if you want to know whether it's a pneumothorax, it's the best way to see. I had a loop flowing somewhere. Can you show the loop? Oh, it's late. Okay. So uh, the lung ultrasound is able to show effectively whether the lungs, the lung pleura are sliding or they are separated. So this is a very easy skill to learn um, to, to know whether there is um, pathological air between the two pleura and you have very definite uh, unambiguous images uh, which can help us um, confirm our diagnosis. So as I said, lung ultrasound is an easy bedside tool. You can repeat it as many times as you want. Minimal discomfort to the baby, immediate answers, and the learning curve is quite um, quite steep, and it is very cost effective. So this is um, a quick uh, show is that, you know, on the left side of the image, you can see uh, the lung pleura is moving. This is why the, the vertical lines seem to be moving a little bit. A is for air. So on the right side, you have A lines, but uh, horizontal lines, which are which don't seem to be moving. So this is the point where you can see on the chest wall, on the parietal pleura, this is exactly the point where the two pleura separate. So there is absolutely no ambiguity about it. Thank you for your expert comments. Thank now you. I'll move to Dr. Manoj, who supports the heart. Uh, the left pneumothorax, this baby had a left pneumothorax, gets drained uh, with needle drainage. And on day two, on SIPP mode of ventilation, the infant appears pale pink, with a capillary refill time of three seconds, a blood pressure of 32 by 23, mean of 26, urine output of 1.2 ml per kg per hour, chest X-ray shows mild cardiomegaly, X-ray shows uh, echo shows one millimeter PDA with a bidirectional shunt and LV dysfunction. What is the next choice of treatment? Uh, can you raise hands who will opt for option A? You saw the blood pressure, I'm sure. Who will opt for A? Uh, who will opt for B? Uh, who will opt for C or D? Anybody for A? Please raise your hands. Anybody for C? Okay, a few people are there. Okay, if if you decide about ionotropes, what is the drug of choice for ionotropes? Option A, please raise your hands if you support. Option C, please raise your hands. Okay, right. So quite often we hear the resident, the resident are telling uh, the BP is low, but the baby is well, what to do? Uh, so can you, Manoj, can you describe the ap approach to neutral hypertension in a preterm infant and discuss the management of cardiovascular compromise in the same patient? Hi. 
So the blood pressure is uh, commonly employed and uh, one of the common uh, surrogate marker used for to assess the cardiovascular well-being of an infant and uh, whether the blood pressure is normal then most likely the heart is working well. But I think there is a problem in this assumption, uh, mainly three. The first is uh, that we don't have a robust uh, definition of what is what constitute a normal blood pressure. Uh, because if you look at uh, the common definition of uh, uh, hypotension is most of the people will use uh, mean blood pressure less than uh, gestational age. And there are uh, not enough uh, randomized control data sub validated this uh, definition. I think the second issue is uh, about uh, blood pressure uh, using as only marker of cardiovascular well-being is uh, uh, its association with the organ perfusion. I think it is not correlated with well. Your blood pressure may be normal, but your organ perfusion might have been is, is compromised. The best example is sometimes the bleed. The blood pressure is the product of cardi cardiac output and peripheral vascular resistance. So if you have got a bleed, the baby's body peripheral vascular resistance will go up and the blood pressure is maintained, but the organ perfusion will be compromised. If you will see normal blood pressure, but the, if you do an echo, SVC flow will be, will be low. So I think uh, that is another. And the third is the most important thing is the outcome. The outcome, particularly uh, if you look at the, there is a positive of randomized control trial whether if you follow a, a, a dictum of permissive hypotension means you just observe and don't do uh, treat it versus you treat a blood pressure based on just a number, there are not many data suggesting uh, are available. Only observational studies are there and they are contradictory. I think some studies have shown that if you treat uh, hypotension, it is associated with IVH and increased mortality. At the same time, just recently, one study from France came that they just treated an isolated hypotension and the outcome was better. So I think the picture is not very clear. Uh, uh, Manoj, can we discuss the management? Yeah, so I think funny. if uh, simple thing, what I follow is uh, if the baby is clinically stable, uh, use all uh, other parameters that if the urine output is good, lactate is not high, uh, CFT is normal, then I think uh, a approach of permissive hypotension might be acceptable and uh, uh, there are stuff, studies to support that the uh, outcome is not bad. But if there is a, uh, a systemic, uh, 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 I think cardiovascular compromise, then you might have to use uh, integrated approach, use clinical, th clinical use uh, your biochemical uh, uh, parameters. If you have got a facility of eco, you can use uh, echocardiography. And particularly if you have got a nurse to look for the organ perfusion, then you incorporate everything and then come to a uh, uh, conclusion. But I think most of the unit in, uh, at, uh, in, NI, in NICU in India might not be having easily available eco. So I follow this uh, simple principle of uh, look at the systolic blood pressure, look at the diastolic blood pressure, and look at the um, mean. I think it's very simple. If you have got a low diastolic pressure, then um, mainly two, three major causes. One is warm shock and the PDA. I think the difference between warm shock and PDA is PDA, the pulse pressure will be widened, whereas in warm shock, the pulse pressure usually is, will be normal. But there will be some element of decrease in systolic pressure. Uh, if you have got a systolic is low, then most likely you have a problem with the contraction. So I think then there may be a septic shock, uh, which in a severe cold shock, or a, there is a cardiogenic shock of any reason, or sometimes PPHN. Um, if there is a systolic and diastolic, both are low, then same PPHN as I as in the list, cardiogenic shock or a PDA. I think treatment is if if you have got a peripheral vasodilatation, diastolic is uh, is uh, is low, then most likely you will have to consider uh, some sort of vasopressin, uh, vasoactive substance like vasopressin or dopamine. But if you have, you have got a problem with the contractility, then you can consider using dobutamin or uh, epinephrine or non-epinephrine. I think um, if you have got a sepsis as a 
cause of this one, then I will I would prefer norepinephrine. Uh, I, I think this it's uh, a very this, complex topic and can be debated. Uh, this on uh, this our infant develops uh, hemodynamically significant PDA, but since the next session is going to be only on PDA, we will skip this slide. You agree with me? Okay. So the, the, so PDA, there is a talk is there, so you don't want to... Uh, if you want, maybe one slide, because uh, next uh, for 45 minutes... Oh, yeah. Okay. So you can go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now we'll move to Professor Aaron Nair. Okay. Uh, this baby on day one receives oral, oral cholesterol and started on t uh, started TPN. Trophic feeds at uh, 20 ml per kg with expressed breast milk. Enteral feeds reached uh, 40 ml per kg on day five, along with total parental nutrition. The following are contraindications for early enteral feeding: dysmotility, umbilical arterial catheter, hemodynamic. Who all will agree with this? Raise your hands. None. I think that's good. Uh, Dr. Arun, can you explain the barriers and strategies for initiating and advancing early enteral life feeding in extreme premature infants? Okay. Um, at the outset, I want to thank the organizers for having invited me and the rest of my uh, colleagues here. We didn't have time to talk about it. But yes, uh, thank you very much for Manoj and colleagues. The question here is the barriers to initiating uh, enteral feeding in extreme preterm babies. Uh, I have outlined here three major factors that come can impact the enteral feeding. And the first and foremost would be non-availability of the mother's own milk. Um, this is one baby in which I would be very wary of using a formula. So I'm, I'm really interested in mother's own milk here, and um, I don't have time to really go through about how we can go about it, but I have given you a reference here from our own uh, um, you know, in Hyderabad, uh, Murki and uh, his colleagues, they have dealt with this in a very recent article. And I think I will refer you to how we can, you know, overcome those sort of things. The second and the most important thing that I have found is lack of knowledge and understanding among the healthcare workers. Um, I'm not blaming anybody here, but the, the, the problem is that many, many of our colleagues are still not on board with this understanding that the intestines of these babies will not be paid is, is going to stunt. The villi are going to atrophy if you have not started feeds as early as possible. You have to remember that fetuses, when they are in the womb, are constantly being fed by the amniotic fluid and the other substances, and the intestines are working. And if you keep the baby's intestines not working or not giving enough substrate, there is major harm that can happen. And then there, of course, there are many medical and surgical problems. Uh, this is a paper by Kuhn and Tal, uh, which was published recently and was forwarded to my, me by Prakash. And this uh, illustrates very clearly as to how any of these barriers can be overcome. In fact, none of those are really barriers if you really understand. This is where I said, you know, understanding is the most important thing. Uh, I don't want to spend more time talking about this, but none of these things should be considered as a real barrier. Uh, can you describe a sample feeding protocol for the benefit of the participants? Uh, sure. Um, you know, there is enough data now uh, in literature which says that a standardized feeding protocol is the most effective way of really giving nutrition as well as preventing complications uh, as a result of uh, being born very premature baby. Here is an outline of what uh, one of the authors have put in. We more or less follow the same sort of a protocol. Again, have a standardized feeding protocol in your unit and stick to it. That's my recommendation here. Okay. So what is neonatal refeeding syndrome? Good. Um, so, this is a very new concept. I think this is from a, star, in a in a work that we are doing at Ligins Institute, where I'm a part of the team. We have been doing uh, early aggressive nutrition and newborn babies. That's been the theme for the last just maybe a decade and a half, that we have to be giving more proteins, we have to give more calories and those sort of things. And what we have found is the similar sort of problems that we used to see when we were giving uh, you know, nutrition to the malnourished babies or malnourished infants in our setting. 
it should not be very, uh, you know, mo most of the Indian crowd should be familiar with what we used to deal with. We are finding that these sort of things are coming up, you know, with early and aggressive nutritional support. Be wary of that because we have developed a sort of a, uh, uh, um, a, a scheme to tell you that refeeding syndromes, as is defined here, with the serum phosphate uh, being low and the total calcium going up, is associated with increased morbidity and mortality. And uh, it's been linked to, uh, this is linked to high uh, amount of IV proteins that are given. And this is part and parcel of a study that we were involved in called the PROVIDE study, where we were giving extra proteins to the babies as a, uh, as, a, uh, as, an, uh, as a strategy to see, you know, if it improves the new low developmental outcome that is our primary outcome. But then we have found uh, in a secondary analysis that we have done recently that some of these babies, especially the ones who are growth restricted, they are the malnourished babies coming from the womb. You need to be aware of this sort of problems that can come. And you can see in this uh, cartoon here how it can impact on almost every morbidity that we talk about in a very preterm baby. Uh, day six, this baby passes the first meconium. And we noticed uh, increase in WBC count, increase in serum alkaline phosphatase, increase in blood sugar and metabolic acidosis. The antibiotics are upgraded to tazosin and vancomycin or aseptic workup. And day seven, there is a mild distension of the abdomen with no tenderness. Abdominal X-ray reveals pneumoperitoneum. So the most likely diagnosis, who will, uh, please raise your hands if it is A. Please raise your hands if it is B. Please raise your hands if it is, uh, sorry, B, I will repeat it again. What I meant was C and the last is D. Who will opt for D? Yeah, majority is opting for D. Uh, who is opting for spontaneous intestinal perforation? A small number. So the abdominal X-ray reveals pneumoperitoneum. Laparotomy reveals uh, spontaneous intestinal perforation. Undergoes resection colostomy, end to end anastomosis after two months. So, Dr. Arun, how can we differentiate SIP from neck in a preterm infant? And can you just briefly mention outline methods of prevention of neck? Uh, it's going to be pretty difficult because, you know, if you if you look at it, this is this this risk factors for both are almost the same. Very low birth weight babies who are, you know, growth restricted and so on and so forth. The tools will be, as uh, I mentioned here in the slide, as clinical, laboratory, radi radiological, and finally exploratory laparotomy. More, more often than not, you would end up doing an exploratory lap laparotomy for these sort of babies. We can't be 100% sure. And of course, at the end of the day, there is a histology to go by. And as I have mentioned here, between uh, spontaneous uh, intestinal perforation and NEC, one of the clinical findings that I often use is a baby who's not looking that sick. There are no much inflammatory markers around to show that there's an inflammation going on. And uh, it's something that has happened very early in the course of the child's life. You know, often we have NEC coming towards the end of the second week or so, or 10 days or so and so. And if it is happening much earlier than that, it goes in favor of SIP. And of course, when you do a lap laparotomy, you will be able to see that Often in an NEC, there may be multiple perforations, large segments of intestines signs are involved, and then uh, inflammation is obvious to the surgeon. And when you send for uh, analysis or, you know, of the tissue, you will see that already changes that I have mentioned, like uh, NEC would be obvious and NEC, but it won't be. So it's not that easy, but there are some clinical markers that you can use. Okay. This is an actual patient in our unit, the particular X-ray which I showed. Let us go to the next one. Any uh, one slide about prevention? You have time, or uh... yeah, yeah, I can I can quickly say if you, if okay, you allow fine. me. Uh, you know, some of you may have uh, listened to my talk about um, uh, evidence-based practice using bundles of care. In fact, there are lots of evidences uh, for prevention of NEC now available to us. When you put them all together into a bundle, as you can see here. Uh, you know, use of human milk, which I have already talked about, or immune therapy, you know, it's a big name used for just using your fresh human milk, mother's own milk for mouth care has got some immune benefits, probiotics very early, uh, and standardized feeding protocol, I have already talked, um, antibiotic stewardship, 
you know, we have to be very careful. And I have I've seen with quite distress that they use a lot of antibiotics and, and uh, uh, you know, resistance and other stuff is coming on. So being very careful about how you use antibiotics, optimizing uh, intestinal perfusion, which our speakers have already talked about, and prevention of anemia. You know, there always used to be this issue whether blood transfusion causes anemia. I think that's no more an issue. We know for certain it is not the blood transfusion, but it's the anemia and the reperfusion injury that can happen after you start giving blood. That causes the, an increase. So there is an anemia, get on with it early and try to avoid it. That would be my suggestion. And this is a bundle that you can put it uh, put across in your uh, setting. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Anil. But I, I don't know. I'll time to move over to the brain. Uh, I invite Dr. Uh, Professor Elon Shani. <clears throat> can we protect the brains of uh, these preterms? Do you think it's possible? Well, first, I would like to thank you for having me here and uh, thanking Dr. Manoj. It's really a pleasure to be here between you. And I think that uh, the panelists actually did the work for me because uh, everything that you talked about is what it's about protecting the brain. But if we look at if we look at a premature baby and a premature baby like the one that you described is definitely a very sick baby. But he's not only a sick baby; he was sick before he was born. It was a sick fetus. Because we, we already know, like, uh, if you look at the placenta, and the placenta is a part of the fetus, the placenta is also sick. And it disrupts uh, a lot of processes, and it also affects the brain. So when we look at the brain, and we know, well, m most of you, I mean, all of you probably know that uh, about the germinal matrix, that these are uh, neural cells that uh, are around the, the ventricles, but can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, these cells, we know them not only because they are affected by uh, IVH, but they are, they are also the basic of all our neurons and glia that uh, eventually will populate our brain. So um, <clears throat> we, we, the, the real question eventually is, in this sick baby, can we change something? Can we change the trajectory? Can we heal the brain that is already affected? Or can we, uh, can we promote healing processes and stop uh, any untoward processes toward the brain? Uh, the best would be a magic bullet to have uh, the drug that will stop everything. And erythropoietin was... Uh, um, suggested drug or uh, a silver bullet, but it didn't work. In this uh, uh, recent paper, uh, 1,000 babies were treated, uh, half of them were treated with erythropoietin and half were not treated with erythropoietin, and it didn't work. So we had to find other strategies. And uh, please continue. Next slide. Um, uh, can you outline a neuroprotection care bundle? for preterm infants, which is getting more popular these days. Exactly. So um, the, if you can go on to the, to the next slide. So we, we are talking about nowadays about protocols and bundles because we don't have the silver bullet and we have to go and see what is done in other units and how come, I mean, we know that some units have got babies that fare better and some of them, they fare worse. So. By going to each and each of these units and looking where uh, the outcome is better, we're able to come up with bundles. And most of the bundles, and the next two slides I'll show it also, we're talking about the same things. If we're talking about the golden hour, we're talking about birth in referral center, we're talking about giving steroids, before birth, gentle handling, delayed cord clamping, uh, respiratory support, which is gentle, either CPAP or uh, volume-targeted, cardiovascular support, and treating infection. A treating infection is not only, it's, it, it, you know that the infections also affect the brain because free radicals, they, they, um, they are, when there is an infection, there is a lot of free radicals around and they arrive to the brain and they affect the brain. And uh, this is one bundle in, uh, uh, also in a recent paper. And you see that uh, the same ideas are in 
most of the bundles, and I would add at least here uh, the family involvement, which is extremely important. And we heard before, I mean, family involvement is not only the mother and the father. And we have to know that in many societies, these parents they are very young and they have their parents that are also part of decision making and are also counseling and they ask around and we have to we have to get them to support the baby and to support the families which is eventually is very important for the baby and we want to be the parents part of the team that treat the baby it's uh, uh, it, i cannot really emphasize how important it is to have parents near the babies and uh, i i don't know we have a personal experience of babies that fare much better when they have the mother that is continuously near them. Um, can we go to the next slide? Uh, can I uh, throw some questions at the audience? Sure. Probably this is the last one. The sensory system of the fetus and, and uh, in, uh, infant develops in a sequential order and the following statement is true. Vision develops earlier than sound. Option A, anybody supports that? Option B, vision develops earlier than smell. Please raise your hands if it is true. There are a few. Uh, and then option C, touch is the earliest sensation to develop. I think most of you got it right. So can you describe developmentally support care and neuroprotective core measures? So um, probably you all, you all know this cartoon of the, of the Lotus and uh, Again, it's talking about the same basics, but what I would like to, to stress here is that, and when you talked about the senses, it's the importance of letting the babies rest. And we all know the nurse that come at four o'clock in the morning to the internal ward and lights the light up and say, good morning, sir, how are you today? And stick the temperature probe into you and give you the medications. And this is, this is not healing. This is not a way that you can help people to heal. And it's the same for the babies. If you come every half an hour, you open the doors of the incubator and you say to the baby, hello, I'm here. I need to prick you. I need to take a blood sample. Well, I just forgot to take a blood sample half an hour ago. I'm going to take it again. And I just want to do an ultrasound scan. I just want to do an echocardiogram. And it's a never ending disturbance of the baby. This is, this is not promoting health to the baby, and it's, it makes sense, even if we don't know how much it really affects the baby, do we know that from the experience that this baby, they fare much, much, much less. Now, I would like to go to the, to the last slide, I think, after this. And we have to remember that when the babies are getting out of the NICU, they're still ex-premature babies, and the families have to be part of the process. We know very well that uh, when ex primis or every child is growing in a family that support the children, they, uh, they fare much better. And this is important, not the less for the ex premature babies. And we have to remember at least quarter of these ex premature babies, they have problems, either cognitive or uh, neurological. And the, the best way we have to remember that uh, the process of healing of the brain, the process of uh, uh, plasticity, it c continues throughout life. It doesn't end when we're born, doesn't end when we get out of the NICU, it doesn't end when we get out of school. Uh, we have just finished right dot on time, but I'll take one last summary slide. The early life of an extremely premature infant is a critical period of transition requiring adaptation of multiple organs and systems. We heard from the experts. And whatever we do, medical interventions can have significant implications on immediate survival and long-term comorbidities. The mantra for an extreme premature infant, infant must not be simply survival. It should be intact survival. With that, I end my... Uh, and before I conclude, let me uh, quote uh, the late William Silverman. We cannot always make our patients better, but we can always make them worse. Uh, thank you, my dear I panelists. I just have a small comment for that. Exactly uh, something we uh, say okay. on our unit is um, patients are not doing well because of us. They are doing well despite us. Okay, right. Yeah. So thank you, dear panelists, for keeping on time and active participation from the audience.
One second, thank you all. We have exceeded only by eight seconds. I think next speaker is waiting online. Thank you again once again. We would like to thank all the delegates for your valuable inputs to this case discussion.